Well, it is Pentecost Sunday, and that's fantastic. I'm excited. Uh, this is this is one of those kind of this is the anniversary of kind of church exploding, and it's kind of neat that right now also what's happening is some uh, some churches are coming out of the out of their upper room where they've been praying and, and doing this, and they're they're launching, they're getting their feet on the ground. And I, you know, my prayer, of course, is that we see just explosions with the, you know they, they, we just see an explosive growth on the other side of that. That's that's my hope. That's my prayer. <coughs> Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, this week we're going to be in um, in Acts chapter 15 as we continue through Acts. Uh, this is this is a a great uh, important kind of point in the in in the Bible uh, in that there's it's kind of the church trying to figure out how we can all go to the same church picnic um, even though we come from different backgrounds. Uh, so there was a lot of different titles I had for this as I as I struggled through uh, what I was going to call this sermon. Um, whether or not it was going to be, uh, you know, whether or not I was going to call it Jeru Jerusalem Council, which happens, or whether or not I was going to say dealing with conflict in the perfect church, because that's also kind of what's happening here. But, uh, I, I also, and then there was a point where I just kind of said, well, what about the let's not have beer at the church picnic uh, title? And, and any of those titles probably work, uh, because it's kind of that sort of thing. What we see in Acts chapter 15 is... Uh, the, the, the result of the success of the church is a whole lot of crazy people are all meeting together. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're, we're focused, uh, the, the narrative has moved, uh, as, as, I've, as I've talked about, Acts kind of has that ballooning effect where it starts out, it's like Jerusalem, and you're dealing with Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, and then the other parts of the world where it just goes, explodes out. We're kind of in the exploding out part. In the last couple chapters, we've seen um, the, the, the shifting of the series, if it was a television series. The lead character is now Paul and Barnabas. They're kind of, they're kind of the leads. Uh, and, they've, and it's followed, the church has, has rolled up, and we've seen churches planted in Samaria, and then we've seen them in, in uh, these other places. Then moved to Antioch in the last couple of weeks, we see that Antioch gets so excited about sharing the gospel, they commission Barnabas and Paul to go, and they go to Cyprus, and they go to like southern Turkey, and every place they go, uh, they, they just shake things up. They start telling people about Jesus, and, and churches develop. Uh, they also do get stoned, uh, not in the way that we talk about getting stoned nowadays, but they, people throw rocks at them and, uh, and try to kill them. But on the end, at the end, they finish their arc, and then they come right back around. Oh, that's okay. I tried that mic and it gets funky. Okay. But thank you. You're welcome. Man, gold star. <laughs> Two gold stars. No, anyway. But yeah, that's what happens. Is as they as they're moving, they they come back and it's great because then the last two weeks we see that as Paul goes back through these places where they had difficulties and they had struggles, he leaves behind. He's looking and they leave full up churches with pastors and everything. I see. Steve, I see you in the cry room, so you can't hear me unless I do this. This mic, though, I do need. <laughs> All right. So uh, what we've seen is that we've seen that explosion, and as a matter of fact, they come back to Antioch and they have a big old party in Antioch where they say, "Look at what God, the fruit that God has done with all of our work," and they celebrate it, and it's big and exploded. As a matter of fact, if there was a picture of a first-century perfect church, the church in Antioch and Syria would be the one. That would be the church to go to. Everything's great. It's got great teachers, great pastors, great people, all of this stuff. They're sending their... They're, they not only did they plant a church, they charted, planted a church planting movement. This is amazing. Um, but when we see that, well, even within the church, perfect church, there's sometimes conflict that shows up. And we have that right here. If you want to open up your Bibles, this is Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 is what we're looking at. This is the NLT uh, translation I have up there. Uh, While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and they began to teach, uh, teach the believers that unless you were circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, what has happened is this, this disagreement has come. In many ways, it's come from people that are, are visiting, just visiting, you know, coming from Judea, coming in and saying, this is how things ought to be. And there's some, there's some disagreement and some division. 
and it's interesting because a lot of times people are like, well, I like my church, uh, but, you know, the, one of the challenges I have with my church is we have disagreements. Well, even in a perfect church, you have disagreements. It's reality. And it would be easy when we look at this to kind of roll it out and say, well, what we have is we have the good people on one side of the argument, and we have evil people on the other side. But I think the issue is more complex than that. Because really what it is, it's a bunch of different kind of people all trying to come together. And, boy, that's hard. Um, I, I said this I, I said this on the fly to Dan, and I was like, I had to stop the sermon in the first service. Because I just mentioned something, I was like, oh, i got to write that down. I was like, this is interesting. And I, I said, when we look, look at what Paul says about the church, it kind of rolls down to this. It assumes diversity. Paul's writing about the church always assumes diversity. It commands unity. And it requires love. And that's kind of, that's the reality. Is you got different people that are going to have to go to this church picnic. How do we all get along? Now, some people are like, well, we'll all get along if we're all like me. Right? If we just, it's simple, we won't have any problems if you do everything like me. So, in, in other words, when they're looking for unity, what they say is if we're all, you know, if we're all uniform, then we'll be united. So we just have to not do anything I don't want to do, and then we'll be great. Or, you know, I'm a great uniter. That's what, you know, it's like you're sitting at the job interview, you know, what are your strengths? Well, I'm a unifier. Really, you're a unifier. Yeah, I like to make everything exactly like me, and then we're all unified. That's kind of the deal. So what we have is people coming into the church that's, that are saying, and before I make these, uh, these, these people that are making this argument sound, uh, sound like they're totally evil, their goal is a good goal. They want the goal of unity. Is unity a good goal for the church? Absolutely. Um, is, is their scripture, or is, is the scripture a good thing to base ideas on? Absolutely. So they're basing their ideas off of the law of Moses, and their goal is to be unified. How could there be disagreement? Well, in reality, there's a lot of that. Where we'll come out and we'll have an idea and we'll come in and, and we'll do all this sort of stuff. Well, the reality is that, that we have to struggle with these things. We have to lay it all out there. We can't just take the, the easy one. Because what also happens is maybe I'll have something that I want to do and I'll use the, a Bible verse to justify my position. As, in, as opposed to taking the Bible and then having the Bible change me, I then use the Bible, I'm, instead I'm using the Bible to justify where I'm at. And that is, a, that is a risk. So the good thing about the church is you're not alone. If it was just me on a mountaintop, I would be able to do that all day long. But God has stuck me with other believers on purpose. So that every time I come up with some knucklehead idea and I lay it out there, I have somebody that can be the other side and say, Rick, what about... Dot, 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 dot. Right? Shh. She knows that's her job. Actually, I love that what, you, that, that what you wrote down because it brought my mind the picture of Paul's using the metaphor of the body for Christ yes. for different parts. And I'm thinking, well, gee, if we're all just feet, we've got to be. Running things all over. Running anything's all over, absolutely. And the requirement, the reason that we have to love, love, by the way, in the Bible is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a virtue. It's something that is hard to do, not something that's easy to do. And the reason that it's required is because diverse people are different and they're naturally going to be stepping on each other's toes or functions or whatever. So the requirement of us trying to love and, and pushing in that effort, that, that's the thing that makes it beautiful. It makes it hard, but it makes it beautiful. That's what unifies us. Um, and that's, that was one of the things I remember. Uh, so three years, so this is three years our anniversary being called True North Community Church, and, and, and some, some major changes happened the first Pentecost in 2017. Um, but uh, one of the things that I remember early on, I was doing a lot of correspondence with Josie. I'm sorry, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to use this conversation because it was, it was a good conversation. And I would be asking things, and she would be asking other questions, and she's like, is it okay that I'm asking other things? I was like, absolutely. I was like, because what I need, and I used a military term, right? You remember what I called it? I don't remember what I used. I know you kept doing military stuff. Yeah, I did. I, I called it a red cell. 
I said, when we do planning, we need a red cell. You always need somebody that's not part of the initial planning, that's on the outside, that's whole goal is to shoot holes in the plan. Because otherwise you have group think, and you have group think, and you're like, we're going to do this and it's going to be great. But you need to have somebody that you can trust, that has your best interest at heart, that can come up and say, if we do that, how are we going to handle this? That it causes the, the thing for you to, because then, then you, you shape your ideas and you, and you get a better thing. It's a, it's a picture of the church. It's why God doesn't make it all uniform. Because we have that sort of thing in just this bigger picture. And that's what we see. Now, the tr trouble with these people that are coming from Judea, and they're coming in and saying, hey, we've got to be unified the way that I say it, is they're claiming authority, and the authority that they're claiming is because we come from Judea. In other words, because we come from a big church, you ought to do it this way. Right? Or we come from the mother church, we've got to do this way. Now, Christian authority is different than organizational authority that we see in other places. For me, if you hadn't picked up, I will tell you right now, one of the things that I'm going to use almost in a creedal sense is the Great Commission. So I'll hang the Great Commission out there and I'll say, the Great Commission is the end of Matthew 28, where he says, Jesus is saying to his church, he's commissioning his church, he says, all power and authority is given to me, therefore go and make disciples. In other words, the way that we go and make disciples is based off of his power and authority. Jesus has the power and authority. He, divests, he gives it to us to do, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the things I taught you, right? Those sorts of things. And surely I'm with you even to the end of the age. That right there is kind of that thing that hangs up on the wall and says, this is what, when we're talking about church, this is what church looks like. And um, our authority then goes back to Jesus' authority because it's following the commission. That's, that's our, our thing. So their claim is that we have it because we came from a big church, or from, from Nashville, or we, I don't know. Southern Baptist, I'm assuming, would be Nashville, but... <coughs> we'll see. Uh, the church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way to Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them how much... Uh, sorry, they told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. Now, I'm going to point this out, because this is kind of important in the narrative. In, a, in one sense, it's kind of nice, because... We, where we originally met Barnabas and Paul in the first part of their ministry was going through, traveling through these areas. And then, then Paul, you know, Barnabas had to travel through these areas to get Paul because Paul was living in his mom's basement. Maybe he wasn't. But it, you kind of get, there, there's a point where Paul's, Paul tried twice to kind of lead a church movement and failed. They're driven out twice with people trying to kill him, and then we see him eventually being in Tarsus. Not know what he, now, I know he's from Tarsus, so the idea is, that's why I said he's probably in his mother's basement. You know, eating cream pies or something, and just, just being sad. But, you know, just kind of eating ding-dongs or moon pies or whatever they had in Tarsus. And then what he, what he does is, is Barnabas is like, I know the right guy for Antioch. And he goes to, to Paul in Tarsus and drags him back to Antioch and starts this whole thing. So right here we see them kind of going through these churches at the beginning. It's kind of showing that movement back. It's kind of tying a bow on the end of their missionary missions together. Because after this chapter, by the way, Paul and Barnabas are going to separate in two different ways. Um, so it's closing out this season. Um, but one of the neat things is if we thought about churches like their authority, let's say their authority was because of how long they've been around. So, you know, it's like churches that... You know, the Antioch Assyria Church is a brand new church. So, let's say it was established in, in, uh, in 60 AD, right? And then the one in, uh, in Phoenicia and Samaria were probably done in, you know, 50 AD. They're like, we've been a church for 10 years. Or, the, you know, and then the one in Judah had been, or sorry, the one in Jerusalem had been there since 33 AD. So, in a sense, there's that that temptation for us to see that there's a seniority based off of, you know, your time as a church. You know, I look at it, my boys are here, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll use them. But, you know, sometimes it's interesting to hear, like, Ricky talk with authority to Toby because he's been alive two years longer. <laughs> you know, don't you know? Oh, young church. But what we see here is that when, when Paul and Barnabas are describing what has happened through their ministry, even though their ministry is much shorter than the life of that other church, that other church isn't going, oh, how cute it is that you guys are still in that stage. They celebrate. More than that, 
There's a picture here where the young church is actually teaching the older church. It's like, hey, by the way, when Jesus go make disciples of all nations, by the way, nations means Gentiles. So Jesus' command was to go witness to the Gentiles. And it took them how long to figure that out? And here it is, Antioch is coming in and saying this. They're not doing it because revolutionary, because you know, Paul just figured hey, maybe we should get, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole market we hadn't opened up. That's not what happened. Paul is looking and saying, Jesus says to the Gentiles, maybe, maybe he's serious. Maybe the authority where he says, all power. And so they move that way. So when they share it with these churches that have been doing business for a decade longer than them. Their response isn't, well, we don't do that this that way. Their response is, wow, I see the authority, and they take it on board, they rejoice in it, and they change. Now, I've talked before how, um, how in the church we all build each other up. It is This is where we're seeing it as churches, like organ, groups, uh, not kind of always building each other up. On the individual level, it's, it ha happens the same way. So somebody could come in, give their life to Jesus, and the next minute gives something that is essentially discipling somebody that's been a believer forever. And it happens, it's, it happens in the funniest ways. Somebody that's a brand new believer, fresh eyes, is reading the Bible, they have, a, they have something, they have a struggle, they'll come up and I'll pretend like I'm super mature because I'm the pastor. And they'll come up to me and they'll say, you know what, I was reading the Bible and it said this sort of thing and they'll have the application even. They'll be like, and in my life, this is happening, but that doesn't seem right, and I'm struggling with it. And, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right. And they'll leave, and it'll be me that had the application. I'm like, oh, i got to write that down. i got to make sure that I do that. God does that. He builds us up as a community of believers. That's why it's so important to be together and to be building each other up that way. When they arrived, so now he's traveling down to Jerusalem. When they arrived to Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and the elders. They reported everything God had done through them, but that some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Exact same argument that was made there. So now you know where the guys came from. The folks that, that came in there. Um, so the apostles and the elders met together to resolve this issue. And I love the fact that they did. What they did is they, they didn't say, well, okay, uh, let's agree to disagree. They really kind of go, hey, this is a big thing. Let's figure it out. Let's sit down and, and iron this out. And what has happened is one, one group has come up and said the scriptures. And that's what they're claiming. They're claiming the scriptures. We say they must get circumcised because the Bible says so. Boom. Now, evangelicals, Christians, Baptists, we have a tendency, a lot of times, when somebody will come up and quote a Bible at us, we'll assume that they've researched it and they're doing more than just, just justifying their position. And we won't argue back. We won't dig it up. We will look at it and we'll go, oh, they must be right. There's a Bible verse. Hesitations, chapter 2, verse 15. And you're like, that must be it. Hesitations, chapter 2, I'm not going to open up my Bible to find out there's no book of hesitations. It's like, in a sense, they just, you know, or they quote Ben Franklin to us. You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. You're right, it is. It's in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. Absolutely, you said God. It must be true. Right, we'll do it. We'll do that sort of thing. We'll, take the, we'll go, oh, it must be right. No, no, that's not what they do. They say, okay, there is scripture, but what does that scripture mean? And they start digging it out. They start examining. See, folks can even resist the movement of God using the scripture. Historically, I'll chase this rabbit a little bit um, just to, to do it. Uh, when we talk about things like salvation, uh, there are some, some debates within Christianity about how exactly it works. Not that it works but how it works. And the debates often sit around um, whether or not, what, how much predestination, how much it's God's sovereignty and all that, and how much it's free will. And the debate's been going along whether or not it's Augustine versus Pelagius or whether or not it's, it's uh, uh, 
Calvin versus Arminius, whatever the deal is, those are the two general ideas. I, I will tell you, just in truth and advertisement, I generally come down on the Calvinist side, the, the idea of predestination and all that sort of stuff. That's where my theological bent is. However, there are people that have come from that bent who start out and say something like, God, God predestines people to come to heaven. And, and they look at verses. And are there verses that say God predestines people to go to heaven? <clears throat> there are. Man, we're even going to talk about one in Acts chapter 15 where they're going to mention something that sounds like it. So they'll take out that, they'll take that, and then they'll say, well, because we believe that, then we must not share Jesus because if we share Jesus, what if we share it to somebody that God didn't predestine? So they take a biblical principle, maybe even a biblical doctrine, and then what they've done is they've stretched it so far out that they teach something that is totally anti-biblical. Does God say, go and make disciples? Does he, does he, has he commanded me to go witness to Jesus, about Jesus to everybody? I don't have an option. That is, I am compelled to do that. Whoever God saves, God saves. I have, to, I have to do this sort of thing. So the Bible clearly says that I have to go and witness. Now, God's going to gather up all sorts of people that, are going to be, that I'm going to be surprised by. But what can happen is we can use the Scripture and we can end up even using Scripture that, that you can find and point and end up in a position where we do the opposite of God's goal. That's me. That's them. And that's what they're doing. They're saying, you know what? Before, when we wanted people to join, the, when they wanted to join and be part of uh, the Jewish congregation, they needed to be circumcised. And that is all true. And they needed to hear, in the, in the law of Moses, it all needed to be done. So they had a basis. But what's going to happen is they're going to do this. After a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that uh, God chose me from among you uh, some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. So he's pointing out, he's like, hey, listen, remember how I went and talked to Gentiles, and got the, the speaking in tongues, boom, all that huge thing, and that happened, we go, oh my gosh, God blesses Gentiles. God's included them in the group. God made no distinction between us and them, and he cleansed their hearts through faith, so why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are saved the same way. We are all saved the same way. Uh, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. How many knew that Peter said this? Is that a surprise? This sounds just like, if I was just to put that one up there, we believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. You would say, that was Paul from the book of Romans, right? That is Paul from Galatians. No, it's Peter. Surprise, right? He's making this undeserved thing, and really that's important to recognize that we're all, we're all saved by undeserved grace. So what Peter's doing is he's, he's turning around and he's calling kind of more on general principles. He's like, okay, well, let's talk about the general principles. We know that God is saving Gentiles. We know we've seen it. We've seen the fruit. We know that his goal is to save Gentiles. So when he's, he's looking at this debate, he's like, well, I can understand. I understand the rationale for saying they have to be circumcised. They have to do these things. and They have to adhere to the most... Uh, the law of Moses. However, we've been teaching that it's not the adherence to the law of Moses that gets us saved. It's faith in Jesus Christ. So if that is the truth, if that theology is true, then there's, there's something wrong here. There's a hole here. Everyone listened quietly to, as Barnabas and Paul told their, about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they finished, what they're doing is sharing the fruit. Hey, this is the thing. God used us. These are the fruit. These are the changed lives we saw. When they finished, uh, James stood and he said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time that God first visited the Gentiles to take from 
them a people for himself. And this uh, con conversion of the Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. And um, what is happening right here is we're talking, we're talking about how the, the fruits, uh, kind of the fruits are, are confirming uh, all the movements of what's, what Barnabas and Paul has done. And I, think, I can think about in times, like as a Navy chaplain, working with people that were different denominations than me, I would say that there, was, there were some of those people that you could clearly see the fruits of Jesus Christ living out of their life. It didn't matter. And I know there are people that, that I love deeply, that maybe some in Baptist, that are, will be upset that I could say that I saw in a Catholic priest uh, very, you know, even though they're, they're not, you know, they're, I, I got people that love Jesus but have really strong denominational lines. They get nervous about that. I can think of my friend that's a Russian Orthodox priest, knows Jesus devoutly. Now, I'm not going to do service like a Russian Orthodox priest, um, and I think that there's some things that we used to have all our debates at night, and I know the places where we disagree, but i got to tell you, I saw Jesus working plainly in there. And that's an important thing. Recognizing the fruits re helps us recognize that we're brothers. Now, we may be brothers, we may not be at the same level, but recognizing we're brothers is an important thing. And I'm using brothers, I mean brothers and sisters, but you guys okay with me just using the shorthand? Okay. All men and women, all brothers and sisters. Okay, as it is written, uh, afterwards I will return. And okay, so what I love here, this is James, right? Let me double check. Yes. So this is James. So James is the brother of Jesus. The, the, the disciple James has already been beheaded. So this is James, the brother of Jesus, who writes the book of James. Um, as it is written afterwards, and what he does is he does what I do. You know, I mentioned uh, I use like one of the things when when I, when I have these struggles, I'll lay something up against the Great Commission, and that's kind of it's almost in like a creedal sense. Creeds, uh, that's what creeds are. Creeds are kind of like a shorthand of this is generally what we believe, and you put it up there. So if somebody has some has something, a creed gives you something to throw it up against the wall and say, "Ooh, hey, yeah, okay, does this fit in? Okay, I can explore far, further." So Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, fantastic, we're moving in the right direction. That's kind of the creed. I use the Great Commission a lot of times in almost a creedal sense. I'm like, does it fit in the Great Commission? If it doesn't fit in the Great Commission, then I, I push it away. There's, some, there's, there's, there's a less important sort, and, and that's it. And he does the same thing, and look what he does. This is how he does it, because this is interesting. Because he does it from not the Great Commission, because he doesn't have the Gospel of Matthew yet. He uses the prophets. He says, as it was written, after all, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it. This is important. So that. So the whole reason for the house of David is the so that. So that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those that I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. Um, who has made these things known long ago. In other words, he's like, hey, listen, the, the whole point, you're talking about making these Gentiles Jews to include them in the house of David, if you will. He goes, no. That's not the goal. The whole goal of the Jewish nation was to help restore the rest of the nations. That's a big thing. What he's claiming is the, well, the whole reason for Jesus' power and authority given to us is to make disciples of all nations. So he's doing the same thing. It's, it's almost the same creedal thing that James uh, is throwing up on the wall. I called it, I called it, a, I called him Pastor James at one point. But what he's doing is he's testing the spirits. So somebody gets it, and um, I've heard that, I've said that before, because, uh, you know, there's reference to testing the spirits sometimes. People get passionate and excited about things. We should always test those, those things. Just because we want to do something is not a good enough reason. Just because we have a good feeling in our burning bosom doesn't tell us that it's the truth. we got to weigh it all out. I've mentioned more than once, I've been told about how somebody was going to leave their wife and marry somebody else because their wife is, is holding them back, back in their faith walk. And if they leave their wife and they find this other person, they know this other woman who happens to be a strong believer, if they got with her, then she would be the right helpmate for them, and boy, what they would do for Jesus. And again, let's say you're hearing from a spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit. 
But you got to lay it out there. The people that were, were pushing the, the legalistic requirements on the new believers were not listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, they may not have been listening to Satan. They could have just been listening to themselves or their own prejudices. Those can be just as loud. All right, we're far enough along in the video, so I think a lot of people aren't going to be watching, so I'm okay with seeing what I'm going to say right now when it comes down to it. Um, a good example is the debate that's happening right now about whether or not churches should open and close. And what has happened is they'll come up and people will be very concerned. And they'll make arguments. They'll say things like, we don't want to bury our, you know, our, our older members. <coughs> And they'll lay that out there. And they're like, because for sake of love, we want to keep them safe. To keep them safe. Boy, that all sounds good. Huh? And there's even, is there some biblicalness to keeping your sheep safe? There sounds like some biblicalness. Is that love? That sounds like love. You can find some scripture. There's definitely some emotion behind it. There may be some fear, but we're not talking about that. They'll lay all of those things out there. And that's one side of the argument. And these people will have the fruit of the Spirit, so you'll know that they're believers. And they'll all do that, but that'll be one side of the argument. That's not the side of the argument I came down on. Because I listened to those, and I said, yes, all those things are in the Scripture. And then I come back to my great commission. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Does it say when it's safe? Does Jesus tell me that following him may require my life? So, so risking my life for Jesus isn't a, you know, not, you know, but sure, if you, if you live longer, you'll be a better minister for Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. So I start laying out the, the bigger truths and the And what I come down to is I start coming down and go, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm allowed to close the doors. That makes sense. It's not my church. <clears throat> and I start looking at this. Now, by the way, when I'm saying this, this, this doesn't mean that if you're sick, that you ought not stay home. Or if they, you're susceptible, they're, you know, if you're in a bubble, if you're the boy in the bubble, you need to stay in the bubble, right? That's not what I'm, But I'm just kind of, I'm making it from a, from the church point of view. And I sit down and I, I expand out the, the argument and I start weighing it all out. And I say, well, what about the things that God tells us to virtue? When I look at a missionary, if I use the same argument about closing the church's doors, it would be the same argument that would say we ought not have missionaries in dangerous countries. And when I, see a mission, when I hear a story about a missionary that went to a church and, and, and saved people's lives and then their lives were, were forfeit or the people that came to the church all were executed. And I look at that. Do I think that that was in disobedience to God or do I rejoice in their willingness to die for Jesus? And I look at it and I rejoice because their model follows Jesus. So at the end I come down and I say, oh my goodness, this is where I'm at. But I had to weigh it all out. I can't just... Flip a coin. If it says head, well, maybe. It's, get the omen and thermum out, and we'll throw it out there. And it's from old to it's not, yeah. There you go. It's, we'll cast lots. There we go. We'll see what happens. Uh, and so, my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who turn to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to. Now, here's what James does, and he acts as a pastor here. Because I, it's not just about figuring out what the right thing to do is. The next thing is, now that you've figured out what the right thing to do is, how do we have the church pick up? How do we do that all together? And what he does is he gives a church picnic analogy. Now, I have a question, and I'll, I'll ask it. Um, well, no, I'll say it. I don't want to ask it and, and start the fight. I'll just make the statement. Um, there's nothing in the Bible that prohibits alcohol. There is stuff in the Bible that... that that prohibits drunkenness, but also prohibits gluttony. <laughs> I might struggle with one of those. You be the judge. But here's the deal. Um, that's true. 
Is it true that there are people in the church that struggle with alcoholism? Yes. Okay. So, when we weigh these things out there, we may look and say, maybe we ought not have beer at the church picnic, not because it's a sin issue, but because we're trying to protect this. And we can weigh that, that kind of middle, find a middle way so that we can get to, to still have the picnic. And understanding, and, and the why of why we do things is really important. Now back to my earlier story, I used the, or my earlier analogy where I'm talking about whether or not we close the doors. For this, this means what I don't do is now that I figure out where I'm at and I know what I'm going to do, I don't go troll churches that have it, that close their doors and say, ha ha ha. If you are a real believer, that would be wrong. I try to figure out how to, how to be gracious. <coughs> to those that have different opinions. And that's what he does right here. He says, he gives them these, he says, abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For they, these are the laws of Moses that have been preached in Jewish, Jewish synagogues uh, in every city, on every Sabbath, for every generation. There's a hidden message in here, and I just really kind of want to underline it. So he's giving a lesson to Gentiles and then one of the important things that he says is it's because this is preached in every synagogue. Did the Gentiles go to the synagogues? Some did. Some did, but did most of them? So the lesson about the synagogues isn't for the, 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 the Gentiles, it's for the Jews. What he's doing is he's finding something for the weaker brothers on both sides and finding a way to blend it back. So, for the sake of the weaker brother, this is Romans chapter 14. It's a really important one. It deals with a lot of this. And James, James kind of gives that advice. Don't have beer at the church picnic here. And what he does is he says, um, if the Greek is the, the weaker brother, he's protecting him by, by giving these restrictions. We may not recognize that the sexual immorality and the drinking of blood and all that um, would be a problem for them, except for the fact that's exactly how they worship the week before they knew Jesus. So we would think it would be weird to say, hey, Tuesday night we're going to have an orgy for Jesus. We would think it's weird. They wouldn't have. Because the week before, that's how they worshipped Aphrodite. So you're like, Tuesday night's worship of Aphrodite was exactly that, where we went to the temple prostitutes. And we're like, no, you believe Jesus, it's whole new. So in a sense, it's, it's protecting the alcoholics, if you will. He's building a wall that says these are things, because what they would do is they'd consume blood, they would offer things to idols, they would, they would have debauchery sessions, you know, all that sort of stuff. So they're like, okay, we're going to do this to protect the weaker amongst the Gentiles. And then P.S., the same reason we're giving these restrictions is because these are the things that those, the legalistic Jews are going to have the biggest problem at, and we're like, we're going to try not to stumble those brothers too. He's like, hey, that was said in every synagogue, so they should be on board with it. And you could, you, you know, in a sense, he's like, as you guys grow together. Then the apostles and the elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates, and they went, sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul, with Barnabas, to report their decision. They cho uh, the chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called uh, Bars Barsabbas, I see the word Abba in there all the time, and I just want to go with a dancing queen name, but it's not. And, uh, and Silas. And what they're doing is they're, they're, um, they're actually confronting something. I'll show it here in a second. Uh, this is the letter that they took with them. They said, this is the letter that the apostles, the elders, and, uh, sorry, elders, your brothers in Jerusalem, it is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and uh, Salacia greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. Boy, it is a big difference between being from someplace and being sent by someplace. It's like, that's a huge difference. And church-wise, that's a big difference. So we're, they're not, you know, those other guys weren't our representatives. Uh, so we've decided to come uh, and to complete, 
in complete agreement uh, to send you official representatives along with your, our beloved Barnabas and Paul uh, who have risked their lives in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm that we have decided continue your concerning your questions. Um, for it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must restrain from eating uh, food offered to idols, from consuming blood or meat of strangled animals, and uh, sexual immorality. If you do this, uh, you will do well. Farewell. Now, I don't know if you know this, so the big three that they say for unity here, the first one is no feed the idols. Uh, that kind of makes sense because, you know, if you can't be Christian and something else. you got to just be Christian. That's kind of what they're going with. Uh, they're saying no eating blood. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this, but uh, there's, here's a big churchy word, the Noahic covenant. So after Noah, when they get out of the ark, God says, don't eat blood. And he says that to everybody. So, so they're giving them that, that rule, not because, not because they're like, oh, this is what Moses said. But they're like, hey, this is to pretty much anybody. Because you're a human being, this is kind of the rules. The sexual immorality, um, it's a little more tricky, but I just want to point this out. Um, it's because, part of it is because uh, in... In Genesis, when we see before the flood, sexual immorality is kind of a piece of that piece. So it's like, hey, God seems to really be, that seems to be a big thing for God. Both for Jews and Gentiles. So they look and they're like, well, we got that. Uh, was, was Sodom and Gomorrah Jewish? No. And they were judged because of their sexual immorality. So maybe I ought not do that either. So those three things. Things that brought judgment. Let's, let's not do that. It seems very reasonable. Uh, there you go. Uh, I point two there. That is aside from point one. I mean, you could have an animal and still have the blood regardless of items. Yes. Okay. So, so that that's a good question. So, in in the Noah's thing, it was because blood is supposed to be important in the teaching. So the shedding of blood is important in the life that is owned in the shedding of blood. So in Noah's covenant, that's why God, why God says, you don't drink the blood there, because that, that's the life. Now in a sense, people would consume the, the heart or consume the blood because it's a sign that I'm taking the power of the animal, or I'm taking this. And that's a definitely no juju when it comes to uh, what, what God would want. But what, what we're looking at here is he's saying, and that's why the strangled, and I included both strangled and eating blood. The reason they don't want strangled meat is because the animal's still going to have blood. Um, yes? Also, from, a, from my mother was a nurse, and my sister was a nurse, from a medical standpoint, it's not healthy to eat blood. It is not healthy, you're right. So, not only did it stop the, um, I can't think of the word, but it, no, it was not only religious, it was healthy. It is healthy. It's absolutely, you're right. And same with the sexual immorality. Not healthy. Not, not healthy. The message, we're going to just close right here really quick. The messengers went at once to Antioch where they were called, uh, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day. And they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, uh, both being prophets, spoke at length uh, to the believers, encouraging and strengthening in their faith. And they stayed for a while. So what we see is we see great unity. After they've dealt with the diversity, after they've, they've dealt with the diversity issue, the division issue, the divisive issue, they end being unified. Uh, they uh, sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. Uh, they and many others taught, uh, taught and preached the word of the Lord there. So for us, same sort of thing. When we have division, well, we've got to recognize that when we have two different ideas or we hear these things, the first thing is we, we look for authority. By what authority is this done? Again, having things like the creedal ideas behind us uh, teaches us some whether or not it matches Christian, you know, classic Christian teaching, but whether or not it matches, matches our mission in Christ. We talk about things like having a purpose-driven, purpose-driven life, purpose-driven life. Purpose. Well, what is the purpose? Well, the purpose is the fulfillment of God's great commission. And by the way, when it says teaching the, to do those things. Those things that he taught you are the big two. 
Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, that's it. So if it doesn't fit in that bubble, then there's a problem. Uh, the next one is test the spirits. How much of it is your emotions wanting to do this? Are you trying to justify what God wants you to do? Are you trying to, is it because the people that you like have this position, you want to continue to have that position? So it's way on out. What's it look like with the scriptures? Where's the fruit? Uh, and then the next thing is to agree. Then we've come to agreement on many things. The whole purpose of the church is, is the salvation of the lost. Great. We agree on that. And then on everything else, charity. Grace. With the idea of, you know, we want unity, but unity is going to require sacrifice. And if we do that, then just like we see the church here in Acts chapter 15, no matter how big the division can be, the, how big the, the struggle can be, at the end we can see we can see a unified church. And that's my prayer. That is my prayer here in the churches in America, and the churches <coughs> everywhere, uh, that we can be unified because we still have the same mission. There are a lot of people that are lost in dark and afraid. And we have a light. And clubbing each other with our, our torches is not the best solution. But figuring out how we can work together, that is. Let's go, Lord, prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you did not leave us without your guidance. We thank you that you did not leave us without your Holy Spirit. We thank you that the Holy Spirit uh, grabbed us and drug us to you. That it's your faith that it allows us to, su to su submit to you. It's your faith that allows us to be able to confess that Jesus is our Lord. And thereby we are saved. And Lord, we are thankful for that. And we're thankful that now that we've been saved, that we've been uh, woven together as your church, as your kingdom here, we now have the King's mission. Lord, give us the strength as you have given us the mission to go forward. And bring light to the lost. We see our neighbors that are suffering. Help us find ways to love them and help them through their, through their suffering and point them to you. And we look forward in expectation of fruit. When one day so many of us will be joined together in celebration singing, Holy, Holy is the Lord. What a great day that will be. And until then, we give you thanks for every opportunity to gather in your name. And we thank you. We pray that that you continue to give us the love as you continue to give us the command to be, uh, to be unified. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The last thing I pray for you is a blessing from Numbers 6. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that he makes his face to shine upon you, that he's gracious to you, and he grants you peace. Amen.